my journey towards starting Sunny Baking, I think was actually a long time in the making and uh, really happy to have met Lisa and to be here talking about this because I am so passionate about um, sourcing quality ingredients. But I actually spent, before I got into farming and sort of this lifestyle, I actually spent over 10 years working in really high-end pastry kitchens. So, you know, working really long hours as a pastry chef, in Canada, but also in the UK. And uh, yeah, and I reached a point where obviously there was a high reward with creating something of high quality and the standard was really high. But um, I got to a point where I realized I actually didn't know where anything came from. And it slowly over the years started chipping away at me. And for some reason in the pastry industry, um, it's different than if we were, you know, in the savory side of cooking in restaurants, there's more talk and sort of casual conversation about where chefs source ingredients. But in the pastry world, particularly in bakeries, um, really high scale pastry shops, people don't really talk as much about where they're so sourcing their ingredients. And I think it gets lost behind the the glamour and the romanticism of sugar and something so beautiful yeah and so it started chipping away at me and eventually I came back home to Canada after spending two years in England and I realized you know a lot of our ingredients here in pastry are really low quality and no one's talking about it. Um, yeah. So eventually I set on a course to learn more about where our food comes from. And this led me to working at Wheelbarrow Farm, which is um, a small scale organic, not certified, but we, we have organic practices um, just outside of Toronto. And we grow about 40 different crops with a bunch of different varieties within that. And this is where I met Lisa because I've been working for four years now at the farm and usually working the Saturday Brickworks Market in Toronto. Yeah. And Lisa's so amazing because she's obviously, as you guys all know, she's a huge fan and support of <laughs> small scale growers and food makers. And yeah, but in terms of granola, this is kind of a random thing if anyone that knew me, but I actually been making granola for my family and friends for forever. And then when I first got to the farm, I would constantly be making batches of granola and it would just sit on the counter. It's a great snack for farmers that are like, you know, working out in the field really long hours. And then I realized I'm like, oh, I should just see if anyone else wants to buy this or if anyone else wants to enjoy in the granola because I'm kind of like Lisa where I think everyone should and could make their own granola it's a very simple process but the problem is oats are super saturated with pesticides um, it's hard to find good ingredients anyway so I sort of naturally fell into this research period about a year of of meeting other suppliers and farmers seeing like what the outlet is for sourcing organic oats from a farmer that I know and then yeah just Wait, create, I have to yeah. I have to interrupt you for a second yeah how many, how many of you have spent a year doing research buying any ingredients for your kitchen oh <laughs> not even me right I know we, and I, I just want to highlight that. Yeah. Because, so think of the cost be, that goes behind something, you know, like Teresa's granola versus as she was saying, it's it's really interesting to hear you speak because I mm. think about a, a really expensive croissant from the most expensive bakery in any city. And yeah. that makes it that price. It's sort of like as artificial as a designer handbag right? Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't have the, that substance. And so I'm hearing this and it's like, I love giving you my money, Teresa, because I know that you put research into anything like I have, but I hear like, oh my goodness, a year. That's like a lot of research anyway. Yeah. No, thanks, Lisa. Uh, and honestly, something I wanted to highlight on this call too, is it actually is quite challenging finding really good ingredients that you know, isn't flaky. Like I have, I can build a relationship with that supplier and I can rely on them, but also is really good quality. You know, like maybe I want to support a farmer, but then the quality of that ingredient is something I wouldn't feel comfortable using. 
So yeah. And then also it has to be ethically and organic, you know, so it's quite tricky. And I actually think there's a huge, there's a huge flaw in the system and it's partially why I haven't been able to grow, um, with the, with the goals that I have in my head, I haven't been able to reach those targets because there's, um, a lack in the food system and in, in like our local supply chain that just doesn't exist. So it is an open concept of like, how do we do this as a community? How do we, um, create a better food system? And it's also in relationship to like the policies that are allowed and, and, um, the transparency that, can exist and doesn't exist so So, it's actually sorry yeah yeah so yeah by buying i this is just me but Mm -hmm. by buying your granola for example yeah Yeah. finding the teresa's of the world they're doing the hard work all we have to do is support it that's number one and number two that i actually hear like it's like imagine how many bags of granola do you make at a time Teresa I do it's pretty small scale so in in one batch session I do about 150 bags okay so 150 bags so now let's think of the supermarket that you shop at yeah and think of how many bags of granola do you think are made in a batch of anything that reaches a supermarket shelf Mm -hmm. thousands for sure yeah And so if Teresa who's charging a premium who's doing the work herself, if she can't successfully make 150 bags and scale without issue, how are those products on supermarket shelves made and how are they arriving there? And why are we spending our money on them? Because that's supporting a food system as well. So Mm -hmm. choose Teresa's food system. We're learning through granola. But that really applies to anything from, you know, your jeans to catch up to the donut that you buy, like all of it. Really? And they don't make it easy, you know, like with marketing and the convenience of it all. It's really easy to go down that route. And obviously none of us are perfect. You know, we do the best that we can. But if we're selling a product, it's our responsibility to be as transparent and, um, successful as possible in terms of health and and wealth but at the end of the day lisa you know no one's going to buy anything that's not really delicious so the biggest challenge of all was actually making sure that it was really really delicious and as a pastry chef like that's very important to me and i have really high standards of what delicious pastries and baked goods are so yeah i mean i have to say i'm a little biased but i think it's a little addictive <laughs> but it's really yeah. good and i like i like at the bottom what it you, says it's like stay really, sweet and sunny yeah it's like yeah really happy like i actually feel like, you know, sometimes it's like retail therapy. I actually feel like a better person when I buy her granola. I'm like, Aww. pretty much, I'm like, see, you are. Me. And then I am, see? And so you can all do that too. And it's, it's, we just, it's li- how much is a bag of granola? I'm like embarrassed. Yeah, even. no, it's okay. So we have the first product I launched with is the maple cranberry granola, and it's $15 for 350 grams. And then the second product, which I launched about two months ago, I'm very proud of is chocolate cherry and it's $18. Yeah. For so 320. And for those of you in the U S that's Canadian dollars. She's Canadian. Oh yes. You, Ooh. Like you, guys, you guys get a huge discount on that. Yeah, but, it's true. But it's, there's so much in the bag. That's number one. And there's these cherries and there's chocolate. And then I look on the back because I'm always, if you read my monkey bar favorite thing last week, where I'm eating this chocolate bar and I keep looking, I keep looking back at the jar and the label to think it tastes so good. Like what's in here that I do not want to be eating. Like I I must have yeah. made a mistake. I must have overlooked. And it's the same thing with Teresa's. Normally I would only I, I would prefer a grain-free granola. Um, but I keep looking back and there's that asterisk beside everything. And I'm like, oh, what oil does she use? Unrefined mm-hmm. virgin cold pressed coconut oil. It's so good. Thank goodness. 
thank goodness. Right. So it's like yeah. every ingredient that I read makes me feel happier. The way so Ellen- it's empathy economics is really a way forward. And it's really about also making sure that our money is going to people who are doing work and advocacy and working on policy and root cause stuff too. So it is mm-hmm. easier to buy granola if we are so privileged and fortunate to be able to afford the convenience of buying something from somebody else check what are they doing what are they doing for the greater good it's one of those questions in empathy economics that makes a difference when i wrote not all genes are created equal and you're talking about buying genes talking about it's not just that they're not using chromium and they're not using dyes that they're using organic materials but also there's they have a board that's actually talking about making factories safer around the world for all textiles. So if wow. one dollar or ten dollars or fifty dollars of my money that in that gene, in those pair of jeans are going towards something good, that makes the product that much more valuable. And if you believe in energy, which I think you all do, because everything is energy, like Think of the difference, even if a big company is making what Teresa is making, it's still going to be more automated. It's not going to have her energy in the bag. And that's what we're eating. I choose to believe based on seeing Teresa very early in the morning, even when she's unpacking to get ready. And Lanny's going to back me up on this because Lanny's there right at the same time as me usually. She's really fucking happy. She's like a really happy person. So sunny baking, it's like sunshine is how I think of you, Teresa. You make me happy. And it's one of the reasons why I love starting at Wheelbarrow as one of those farms is because if I can purchase a little more sunshine, especially in this day and age, that's what I'm here for. And that's what I want to share with you guys, that that's available to us if we look for it in all the right places and open ourselves to it. That energy is available and that's healing and nourishing and and all of that goodness. So Teresa, I thank you for being one of those people that are doing so much work for all of us to hopefully be able to buy better oats, better chocolate, better oil, better sh- like better of everything. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Lisa, thanks so much. Honestly, I, I feel so grateful for your support. And this is why I decided to do, decided to start Sunny because of people like you and the desire to fill the needs of people that care about where their food comes from. So, and then once you know, you can't unlearn it, right? And you're, you're part of the system of creating something better. So.